the most important part of any scientific research is not the experiment, the lab, or the funding, though all of those things are necessary. The most important part, some say the hardest part, is the idea. If you're Archimedes, you might get your best ideas in the bath. Uh, Watson and Crick were inspired to solve the structure of DNA by a lecture given by Erwin Schrödinger in Trinity College, and he's a physicist. And Alexander Fleming's discovery of penicillin involved a fortuitous neglect of the washing up. So scientists, like any other creative people, can get their ideas from anywhere. Good idea might come drifting, I suppose, seemingly effortlessly out of your subconscious. It might be ground out of hard work. A new idea might come from surprising experimental results. It might come from linking to seemingly different areas of research. And sometimes, just sometimes, a new idea comes from a man walking into a genetics department with nothing more than steely determination. And his is a story that I've wanted to tell for quite a while. In 1983, Michael Griffith's father was losing his sight to a genetic condition known as retinitis pigmentosa, or P for short. People with Ret or P are born with more or less normal vision, and at some point in their life, maybe their late teens, they start to lose their sight. So Michael, along with another man, Tom O'Neill, established a charity that's now called Fighting Blindness Ireland. And originally, he had quite modest aims. Really, when I asked him, he said all he really wanted to do was cheer his father up. And initially, this charity was just a patient support group. But this all changed pretty quickly when Michael attended the first international meeting of the ORP Association in Finland in 1984. Now, the 1980s are responsible for a lot of peculiar trends and nouvelle cuisine, with the portions so tiny it's hard to tell which is the dinner and which is the garnish, is one of them. But were it not for the fact that the conference gala dinner had nouvelle cuisine that left everybody feeling still quite hungry, Michael Griffith might never have bumped into Show Me Bhattacharya on his way down to the hotel restaurant for a second meal, and he might never have sat with him and had his first and formative tutorial in genetics. Michael didn't recognize Show Me at first, but Show Me was no ordinary conference attendee. In fact, he was a world leader in ORP research, and just a few months previously, he had done some work which had linked the X chromosome version of ORP to just a small region on the chromosome, so he'd really narrowed down the search for that gene. And in Michael's own words, he started that meal not even knowing what a gene is, and he ended it convinced of the power of genetics research to help families such as his. Now, so this is 1984. It's just over 30 years since the structure of DNA had been discovered, just about 10 years since it had become possible to sequence DNA, and it was still a difficult and laborious process. And it was only one year since the first ever disease gene had been linked to a human chromosome. But still, um, Michael was optimistic. He learned a lot about the genetics of ORP from Show Me. And what Show Me had done was he had found the, he had been looking at the X linked form. So men have an X and a Y chromosome, women have two X chromosomes. And this means that men have only one shot at getting a good copy of any of the genes on the X chromosome. And so this is why conditions like um, hemophilia and colorblindness are more common in men, because they only have one shot. And so it's really easy, comparatively easy, to know when something is controlled by a gene on the X chromosome because you can, they're kind of easy to see telltale inheritance patterns. Now, the ORP in Michael's family and in lots of other Irish families didn't have this telltale inheritance pattern. So it was clear that their ORP was caused by something different, a different gene which remained completely unknown. So when Michael came back to Dublin, he asked for a meeting with the professor of genetics, Dave McConnell, in Trinity College. And his purpose in this meeting was to persuade the geneticists of Trinity College to start ORP research 
as a new research program. Nobody in Ireland and nobody in Trinity was working on this. They had just about heard of it. I think it's fair to say that the response on the side of the genetics department was of cautious enthusiasm. The enthusiasm is because, of course, this was an interesting and an important uh, piece of research, but of course we also needed caution because it was going to take a long time to find the gene and um, it was very important to downplay any hopes for gene therapy. In the 1980s, genetics was still new, every discovery felt like a revolution and gene therapy was just science fiction. But unperturbed by the scientific and the financial challenges, they decided to go ahead. Not only this, Michael said he would fund it. Now this was 1980s Ireland, half the country was on the dole, there wasn't much money around, but even in this context, Michael Griffith and Paddy Byrne managed to raise first £10,000 and then £100,000 in 1980s Ireland to fund this research. Shortly afterwards, Jane Farrer, who had then just finished her, her degree and is now a professor of genetics, took this on as her PhD project and she ended up working with Pete Humphreys in the genetics department. So she started working on this, she crisscrossed the country, meeting families, getting DNA samples and medical details, and by 1990, they had found the gene for ORP. This was the first time anybody had linked a gene with ORP. So this work, started and spurred on by Michael Griffith, put the genetics department of Trinity College on the map. The gene they found is called rhodopsin, and it is functioning in the retina, the back of the eye, that's a picture of a retina. And what happens when somebody has one faulty copy of this gene is at some point in their life, the cells in the retina start to die. And so discovering the process and the mechanism for this was a crucial first step to understanding the genetics of this condition and then hopefully um, being able to develop therapies. And it's impossible to overestimate the importance of all the people who got involved, the ordinary people. So people all across Ireland put their faith in the scientists and they were willing to share DNA samples and medical details. And their willingness to do this actually was and remains a cornerstone of this kind of research. But as they were working on this and continued working on this, what they discovered was that RP was much more complicated than previously thought. So what had thought, been thought to be kind of a single, simple condition turned out to be very complicated genetically. And almost every family had RP in a different way. So there are 60 different genes that can be mutated to cause RP. And even the rhodopsin gene, which is the most common one, there are 150 different mutations known in this. So, whereas the research was going really well initially in that they relatively quickly found the gene involved, the fact that there was such complexity at the genetic level and that nearly every family had RP in a different way made the prospects of a gene therapy quite bleak because it's not possible to have a different therapy for every family. This was just completely implausible. Meanwhile, genetics was progressing and growing wider and deeper, and there were great discoveries being made all over the world. And in experiments from things as different as bacteria and flies, they really showed the common link of DNA and how genes operate and are regulated in very similar ways throughout all of life. So this genetical approach to biology is really, really powerful because it takes advantage and harnesses the similarities through all of life. And this outlook was encapsulated quite nicely by Jacques Monod, who's a Nobel laureate, when many years ago he said, what is true for the bacterium E. coli is also true for the elephant. So this basically encapsulated the genetic approach to biology. And one nice example of this actually comes from some plant scientists who were trying to make a darker purple petunia. And so they wanted to make darker purple, so they had the simple idea, well, we want darker purple, let's just add more of the gene for the pigment. So they added more of the chalcone synthase gene, and the flowers came out white. So this was a new surprising result, and it wasn't understood until sometime later in 1998, when Andrew Fire, Craig Mello, and colleagues were working on this peculiar little worm called C. elegans. 
And they were doing work on this, and in the work they did, they discovered a whole new interference mechanism. So some genes can interfere with others. So this is what was happening with the flowers, and this is what happens also in these worms. And they interfere to turn each other off. And so this discovery of um, interference in microRNAs actually won these guys the Nobel Prize in 2006, which is less than 10 years after they made the discovery. So it shows you how big a deal this was. And what they had discovered was a whole new powerful mechanism of regulating genes, turning them on or off. This interference mechanism actually originally evolved as a defense against viruses, which makes it all the more funny that some viruses, like the cold sore virus, herpes simplex, actually hijack this mechanism for their own self-preservation. The cold sore virus that you possibly caught from an ill-timed kiss is actually capable of regulating your own genes. So you've got a little virus inside some of your cells, and it's using this mechanism to turn some of your genes on and off, and it's doing it to ensure its own preservation. But what has this got to do with ORP? Well, it turns out these different seemingly unrelated, seemingly useless pieces of research actually inspired my colleague Jane Farrer to a brilliant idea for a therapy for ORP. And she had the idea that they could use this interference mechanism that shut down, shuts down a gene that could turn off all the rhodopsin, and all the different mutations. So we had this problem that there were so many different mutations, you couldn't have a one-size-fits-all therapy that would target the mutations individually. So she found a way that would target them all collectively. A brilliant idea. And she was also then going to supply a new copy of Rhodopsin that would um, replace the one that had just been turned off. And how would they possibly deliver DNA into cells? Well, you just take an existing mechanism that can deliver DNA into cells, virus. So you can take a virus, modify it, and make it safe, and that becomes your tiny little DNA delivery mechanism. Now, this is actually very promising. It's working in the lab, so it's the brilliant work of these guys, Pete Humphreys, Jane Farrer, and Paul Kenna, and they have this working in the lab. Unfortunately, this isn't much good to Michael Griffith and his family, because in their family, they don't have a mutation in the rhodopsin gene. And in fact, over, you, you need to know what mutation you have in the family in order to be able to take part in and benefit from any of these trials and therapies. And over the years, they've been discovering which are the different mutations in the different families around Ireland and around the world. And the Griffith family, a mutation remained undiscovered. That was until about a year and a half ago, when my colleague Pete Humphreys phoned Michael Griffith to tell him they had finally discovered, almost 30 years after he first walked into our department, they had finally discovered the mutation in his family, and that, for the first time, opened up the prospect of therapies for the Griffith family. Michael Griffith did us a favor when he came looking for our help. Were it not for his perseverance, this project wouldn't have been taken on in the genetics department. It wouldn't have risen to such international prominence and become the stimulating and rewarding place that I'm lucky enough to work in. As a small gesture of our thanks, Trinity awarded Michael Griffith an honorary degree a couple of years ago. So a chance encounter led to a new genetic approach to ORP that now has the hope for new therapies. Thank you.